thank you very much. Uh, it's great to be here. And, uh, come on in. If you can find some room up front, possibly here, or maybe along the side. Um, I'm happy to be here today. And, and uh, what I thought I'd talk about today is, is really what 5G is all about. <clears throat> first things first, to introduce myself and my company. Uh, Mobile Experts is a fairly small market intelligence company. Uh, there are six analysts. Uh, and they're all sort of like me, they're all product line managers uh, by training, or RF engineers uh, in the beginnings of their career, and they only have 20 plus years of experience doing it. Um, and uh, we're, we're very focused on the semiconductor side of the, the mobile business. Um, so in the wireless business, uh, all the chip guys have to plan three or four years in advance what they're going to do, and they need to have a fairly accurate view of where the market is going with a long time horizon, and that's really what we do. Uh, our, our method is really to, to work very closely with the mobile operators to estimate what is the requirement, what are they really trying to do. Um, we calculate the ROI for the operators to try to understand will they make money. And if they introduce a 5G service, for example, will it be profitable? Is this going to be a successful market? Uh, because that, we think that's quite important to the, uh, the scheme of things. And then anticipate their decision based on that. And, and then the most important part, I think, for us is that we track the market by coordinating very closely with chip companies. Uh, so we have 25 different chip companies that share spreadsheets with us on a quarterly basis or an annual basis so that we know precisely how many small cells ship at this frequency band or at this power level and so on and so forth. Um, so that's what we do. Uh, now, uh, we're going to talk about two different aspects here. There's 5G broadband and then there's 5G for the IoT world. Okay. And uh, first off, looking at the broadband piece, uh, how many people in this room would say that 5G is all about speed? You know, the 3G we had 380 kilobits per second, then we went to, let's say, 100 megabits, and, and next we're going to 10 gigabits. Is that the main thing in 5G? Sure. Not a lot of guys raising their hands, and I'm glad they didn't, because I, I don't believe it is. If you think back to the days of, uh, you know, let's say the 1990s, when anyone have one of these PCs in the 90s? <laughs> I had one of these with the little display on the front. I had a 166 megahertz processor, right? And I thought I was really smoking, you know, that's, that's great, that's fast. Everyone talked about the speed of their CPU, the cluster. And why did they do that? Because that was an important factor at that point in time. That was an important piece to how quickly you could run the applications at that time. So the 286 went to the 386 to the 486. And uh, everyone focused on that. But then they stopped. We got to the Pentium. Uh, people stopped talking about this. And I wonder why, why was that? It's because the clock speed was no longer the most important thing. It, it didn't really matter if you had a faster clock. Uh, once we got to a gigahertz or so, uh, it was more about the memory and other things. And it wasn't really about the, the uh, speed of the clock in the, in the computer. I think we've reached that point in the wireless industry now. Um, if we talk about 5G and you know gigabit per second service to your phone, you have to ask the question, well, who can really use a gigabit per second on your phone? If we have this guy on his virtual reality goggles, even, even he, doing VR at, let's say, 720p, he's using 15 megabits per second. A lot of people would think it would be higher, but it's, you know, at, at that level of resolution, it's, it's only 50 megabits. And going to, a, you know, say, 4K video for VR, then you're up into a 500 megabit thing. But still, you know, wearing those goggles is most likely a short range thing and not a mobile requirement. So we're, we're seeing the applications today that, you know, here in the, uh, the things that we really do today, it's in the range of 15 to 20 megabits per second. Now, that's going to grow. And I, I know we're going to go to 8K video. We're going to do some of these kind of things. But it's still a long stretch from where we are to a gigabit per second. And, uh, and so uh, I'm, I'm a bit concerned that if we focus so much on the individual speed for an individual user, we're going to be on the wrong track in this industry. Um, in fact, uh, one of my competitors did this survey. And I won't put their name up here, but they, they, they interviewed a lot of consumers to say, hey, what do you want from your next smartphone? And most people say what they want is faster speed, right? And they do. What they, they, they want their map to come up more quickly. Uh, they want the, the, the Uber cars that are in the neighborhood to show up instantly and not take a minute. Okay, these are, these are useful things. 
But in fact, those things are not dictated by the speed of the network so much right now. It's more a computing platform. Um, and so when, when an engineer looks at this and he says, well, really, what do smartphone users want? They, they don't really need that gigabit speed. What they really want is more consistency. They, they want to have 100 megabits all the time. And then they want improvements to the computing platform so they get that speed. And, uh, and so I think as engineers, it's incumbent on us to try to solve those problems so the end user gets what they really, gets what they really want. Um, now, I think when we talk about a next generation of mobile technology, we have to think about the consumer and what they want, but also the mobile operators. Um, mobile operators are always balancing decisions in terms of the economics. You know, should they invest, should they not invest? And, uh, and so when we look at the history of what mobile operators have done, and uh, you know, I go back to when I was first involved in, in wireless in the 2G days, um, we were trying to drop the cost of phone calls. That was really what it was all about. Uh, remember, anybody remember when it was a dollar a minute to make a phone call on your car phone? It wasn't a cell phone, it was a car phone back then, because it was a giant amplifier in the trunk of your car, and antenna on the roof, you know, that's how it worked. But it was a dollar a minute. And they even launched satellites thinking, oh, we can do a dollar a minute with a satellite. Well, you know, a 2G technology really brought that down by about an order of magnitude. Ten cents a minute is a lot more economical. That's really when people started using their phones, instead of just having it for emergencies only people really started using their cell phone as a, as a primary way of talking and texting. Um, going to 3G, that's when email became affordable. You know, uh, you could send a 10 kilobit, uh, kilobyte email, uh, you could get it on your Blackberry, you could keep track of those. Uh, 3G technology was, was quite adequate for that sort of application. Not really good enough for the mobile web, uh, but Blackberry users were kind of happy with it at the time. That's really because of the economics of the cost per gigabyte of delivering data on 3G was 10 times better than 2G, and it, it got us to a point where that was now affordable. Uh, going on to 4G, you know, and this is where we sit right now, is it's, it's in our 4G network, it costs about a dollar for every gigabyte that the operator sends over the network. Uh, and I'm not talking about their advertising costs or marketing, it's, this is the raw cost of delivering a gigabyte uh, over the, the capital equipment that they have and the operating cost to run that network. Um, so that means that an Uber app is, is great. It's right in the sweet spot for 4G. Uh, it's, uh, it's not a huge amount of data. Uh, it's available all the time. Um, and, uh, and so those kinds of apps have really taken off and, and 4G is a big success. But the one thing that we still can't really do that is still too expensive today is running videos. Um, if, you, if you try to run videos at a dollar a gigabyte, you quickly run out of capacity and you don't have enough revenue. So that's where I think we're going with, with 5G, is it another step down the curve in terms of cost per gigabyte, and mobile videos becomes more affordable, and it'll, it'll reach the point where, you know, like my teenagers do today, all of that video viewing is going to be on a handheld device and not on the big screen on the wall. Um, next thing I want to talk about is, you know, we've, we've actually done quite a lot of work with the mobile operators in benchmarking some of these cost figures. Um, and this is in some of the research that Samsung's already licensed from our company. So, so anyone who needs to dig into the details of this, we'd love to talk through it with you. Uh, we've taken some of these cost models where we look at the cost of the spectrum and the net network equipment, uh, leasing space on a tower, uh, the backhaul itself, and even things like power, and, and look at that in terms of total, total cost of ownership over an eight-year period. And then we look at how much data is actually delivered from that base station over an eight-year eight period, and we can boil it down to, you know, what's the cost for uh, a network to deliver the data? Uh, so with uh, LTE, we've now moved into the small cell realm, and we're adding things like license-assisted access and so on. So we're, we're hovering in the range of about $1 per gigabyte right now in our LTE networks. Um, but uh, in China next year, uh, they're going to be going to 5G in the 4 gigahertz range, and they'll be reaching uh, figures that are in that sort of area, where it's less than 50 cents per gigabyte. And then as we go to uh, massive MIMO, it'll get even lower than that, say 20 cents per gigabyte at the 4 gigahertz range, or in the millimeter wave range, could even be down in the range of 6 cents for every gigabyte. So this is, this is a, a, a turning point. You know, this is really a game changer in terms of the economics of delivering high, high uh, bandwidth items like big videos. So when, when the operators make their choices, you know, the operator goes and they, they think about, hey, you know, are, are we going to invest in more spectrum? Or are we going to buy some millimeter wave spectrum in the auction that's coming up in two months' time? 
Uh, I think one of the, the questions is, well, I mean, how much spectrum is really available? Uh, how much capacity can you really add with that spectrum? Um, what would the network build-out cost be in terms of, of using that spectrum to get uh, adequate coverage? Um, and, and there are two factors that it boils down to. One is, you know, what's the total cost of ownership per gigabyte of data? Okay, we just looked at that one. Another one is, what's the total cost of ownership for every square kilometer of coverage? Um, and so every operator has a balance of low, low band spectrum, let's say 800 megahertz or even 600 megahertz, where you get excellent coverage. And then high band spectrum, that could be in the 4 gigahertz range or the even 30 gigahertz range, uh, where you get very good economics in terms of cost per gigabyte, but the propagation is poor. Uh, so uh, one of the analogies that we talk about often is, is that uh, you know, making these decisions about buying more spectrum or building up more network, it's sort of like real estate, right? If, if you're a, a big real estate guy and there's, there's a vacant lot next door, then you don't build extra storage, you don't build a skyscraper, you just take advantage of the extra land that you have. Okay, and then you might build a two-story building across, across all the property that you have. But when you start to run out of available land, you build up. You go, you go to the skyscraper mode because land is now impossible to get. Uh, and that's, we've seen that played out over the last 200 years right, in, in cities around the world. Uh, I think that's, it's, it's a very good metaphor for what we do in the mobile industry. Is we, when we have spectrum, then we go ahead and build that out with macro base stations. But when we run out of spectrum, then we have to take advantage of new things, like small cells, like massive MIMO. And that's the equivalent of a skyscraper, trying to reuse that same spectrum over and over and over. Question. Yes? So the reason why PCO 4G is lower high frequencies is because of the capex for the spectrum itself? <clears throat> uh, that's one element. Uh, but actually, if I rewind to that chart again, let's see here. Um, you'll see that the, the spectrum is one part of it, okay? The spectrum by itself in the, in the low bands is, is in the range of 50 cents for every gigabyte that's delivered. Uh, but the other pieces are, are quite important as well. Uh, what I would say is that there are certain things that are fixed costs. Like you buy spectrum for, a, for an area, you rent space on a tower, you dig a trench to put a fiber in. Once you pay that money, that's fixed. Then you want to push as much bandwidth through there as you can. To, uh, to spread that cost over as many gigabytes as you can do. Um, so it is, it is true that it's cheaper to deploy something, say, at 28 gigahertz, but you have to have enough traffic in that particular area to justify that investment, okay? Uh, and so this is the balancing act. And so when I go to a view that looks like this, you know, we have, we have things like this 28 gigahertz uh, system where the cost per gigabyte is very low. Let's say that's six cents for every gigabyte of data that's delivered. But the propagation is poor in those millimeter wave frequency bands. So, so that means that it's, it's over a million dollars to, to, to adequately cover every square kilometer of coverage. Yes, sir? So for those of us that don't use wireless 4K video, does it cost them wired 4K video? Yes. So yeah, the question is, what's the cost of, of wired alternatives? Um, this is something we've been tracking for years. Is that you know something like a, a Comcast uh, hybrid fiber coax system that delivers video to millions of American homes right now? Uh, those guys can deliver uh, data about half the cost of, of an LTE network, uh, and they're moving to DOCSIS 3.1, so they're going to they're going to take their own step in technology where they're going to drop their cost in half again, and and they're all going to they're always going to stay a little bit ahead of the wireless technique. Uh, because they have that, that wire in place, and they can they can always take advantage of more efficient uh, delivery of the, uh, the signals. Uh, but uh, I think the argument that I'm making is that now the wireless guys are reaching a point where they're cheap enough that people don't care about that difference in cost anymore. Uh, the convenience of having it as a wireless format as opposed to being plugged into the wall, uh, that convenience is worth a certain amount to people, and I think we're reaching a point where wireless is cheap enough. Are you, is this is dollars per hour. No, no, this is dollars for every gigabyte that's served. What they move is gigabytes. Yeah, let me let me go into that example, and I'll get to your question later. Um, we uh, let's see now. I have a, an example in here. Um, let me go back. I think I took the example out. The, the example that I use is let, let's say you you uh, you're AT and T. You just bought a company called Time Warner, 
which means that now you have all these movies to sell. Okay, and so you have 100 million subscribers that you can sell the movie to, um, and you want to rent the movie for four dollars for an HD movie. Okay, now an HD movie is about a five gigabyte file. Uh, so if it costs you one dollar per gigabyte, now it just costs you five dollars to deliver that movie to a user, and you're renting it for four dollars. That sounds like a loser. Uh, but if if you can actually set this person up on a 5G link, where your economics are now let's say six cents for every gigabyte that's delivered, now you're delivering that that five gigabyte movie for thirty cents, and you're collecting the same four dollars from the consumer. Uh, so that's what the operators are thinking about. That's why they're making these moves into the. Uh, content, the entertainment business, uh, because they see this trend as well as anybody, and they, they expect that their cost is going to come down and that they will be able to make money in that kind of business model. Okay, the point I wanted to make here is that we have, we have these 5G systems where the cost for capacity is very low, but the cost of coverage is high. In our LTE network, our, our cost of coverage is pretty good, you know, it's dollars per square kilometer is pretty low, but the cost for every gigabyte is high. Just one second. Uh, the American operators are kind of stuck with the millimeter wave band and the LTE band. Uh, in some other countries, they have this magical alternative where you can actually get a decent amount of bandwidth and get low cost of coverage and low cost of capacity at the same time. So in China, Korea, and Japan, we'll have alternatives that looks like this. And, uh, and so that's really the place that people want to be when it comes to 5G networks. Yes, sir. Yeah, I don't understand your cost model. I mean, if you spend more money to deploy 5G, why the cost is, I mean, the per GB is uh, less? Yes. Uh, well, we can go into this offline when we finish. Okay. But uh, 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 walking through the cost model, basically, uh, what this says is that you would only deploy this kind of uh, system at 20 gigahertz only in an urban mm -hmm. area. Uh, because you have to have enough users with enough traffic to justify the use of that, that uh, thing. If you, if you put that capacity out in a farm somewhere where there's only one farmer on his tractor, it, of course you're going to lose money. There will never be enough traffic to pay for it. So you have to have a high volume of traffic in order to justify that investment. Okay, now there's, <clears throat> there's a model that my company has developed over the last 10 years uh, where we, we actually track something that we call the traffic density in mobile networks worldwide. So we have relationships with 30 different mobile operators that they, they share some of their density figures with us. And the way this works is we look at their, their mobile network and we take one of their busiest sectors. You know, if you, if you take a, a cell tower, uh, it'll, it'll be broken into sectors. They cover about, let's say, about 0.15 square kilometers for every sector. Oops, see if I can do this. Okay, there. Um, and uh, the tower itself might run about 400 megabits per second, and then you might have a couple of small cells that do, let's say, 200 megabits per second each. So that's a total of 800 megabits per second within that small area using 120 megahertz of spectrum. And so we have this, this uh, calculation that we, we, we call GKM. It's a metric that, that measures the gigabits per second per square kilometer per megahertz. Okay, and in this example, the number comes out to 0 0.04 GKM. Okay, uh, now as we track this for, for many different operators around the world, what we notice is that this is an indicator of sort of economic transitions. Um, and as you, as you go from a low level of density, let's say below 0 0.02, uh, the most economical way to deploy that network is just your macro base stations. That's it, that's all you need. Um, but as you get above a level of 0.02, that's where it's most economical to start putting small cells in between each of these macro towers. <coughs> so you might put a small cell in the subway station and offload some traffic there. You might put one in Times Square because there's a lot of traffic usually concentrated. And <clears throat> that'll take you pretty far uh, because you can continue adding these small cells as you go. Uh, there is a point that we've reached now in places like Tokyo and Seoul uh, where now the, uh, the traffic density is, is increasing above a level of about 0 0.1 uh, gigabits per kilometer per megahertz. And uh, when you get to that level, you really need to implement massive MIMO. Uh, massive MIMO is a technique where in 5G they would, they would be able to reuse the spectrum even more efficiently, breaking the uh, sector into smaller and smaller pieces. Uh, and, uh, and what we're seeing is that that becomes the most economical choice for network development at that level of density. And, and this is pretty interesting. So this is, this is how we lead up to our forecasting of, 
of where 5G will be deployed, how it will be deployed. Um, what we see is in, in uh, Seoul right now, this black line represents the level of density in the Gangnam area, which is one of the most densest areas of traffic that we've seen on the planet. Okay, and, uh, and so next year we expect them to, to reach a level that's almost a GKM value of 0 0.2, uh, which is where we, we think that the network starts to saturate. Okay, um, now what they'll be doing from there is introducing 5G in the uh, 3.5 gigahertz band and also in the 28 gigahertz band. So they'll be able, able to add more megahertz of spectrum and bring down their average density per megahertz so that let's say around 2021, they might be back to a level of 0 0.05 for places where that, that millimeter wavelength is available. Um, so that's how the operators are now looking at managing their spectrum and trying to maintain the performance of the network within acceptable limits. Um, as we move outside of Gangnam into the outer area of Seoul, we expect that they would use the millimeter wave band later. So they might introduce the three gigahertz 5G right away, uh, but that will take them farther because there's just not that much traffic. And of course, in the rural areas, they might never need 5G at all because their, their GKM is quite low. So this is kind of our view of how the network is, is going to be deployed from here on out. Is it, you'll have some rural areas where the macro base station itself is enough, and there's no need for any additional investment. Um, there might be some suburban areas where uh, small cells are a good idea. Maybe something like LAA would be desirable. Um, but then when you get to the uh, center part of the city, you know, this most dense part of the city where the GKM value is, let's say, 0.15, that's where you really need to use the 28 gigahertz uh, 5G link because uh, there's enough traffic to justify it economically. Okay, so putting all this together, when you take the average total cost of ownership of every gigabyte on the network, um, and you're, you're taking, there's still traffic on 2G and 3G as well, uh, so that averages into the equation. Um, as we add our 5G equipment, this, this curve is gonna continue down, farther and farther down, and uh, and uh, I, I don't see any end in sight. I, I think as we deploy the 5G equipment, that's going to be uh, refarmed for the other bands and for the rest of the nationwide networks. And so our, our total cost is going to come down even farther. So we're, uh, we can support these kind of entertainment business models for a long period of time. Um, so our point of view is, you know, 5G broadband is all about video. It's really the mobile business taking over the entertainment business. And because of that, I think the operators get it. Uh, what they're doing is they're deploying a huge amount of capacity. Uh, I had to put this one on a log scale because this, I mean, the amount of capacity that we're gonna see in the 5G network is, is another order of magnitude higher than our LTE capacity. Um, now, it, it, in most cases, it won't be nationwide network. You won't, you won't see 5G uh, in the farm area at all. Uh, but all this capacity will be concentrated where the people are using data. Uh, it's where people wait around and watch videos. It might be where people are at home and they don't want to pay for a cable anymore and use 5G for their home. Uh, so uh, the level of capacity we see through 2023 is tremendous. Um, I guess I'll skip over some of the forecast slides, but one, one thing to point out is that in the near term, the deployment in, in China, the deployment of 5G networks in China is going to take off extremely quickly next year. Uh, we have, in 2019, we have uh, probably 250,000 base stations being deployed in China, uh, which will cover more than 20 different cities and hundreds of millions of people. Uh, so we may see the handset business and the networks business very quickly becoming a 5G market within the next 12 months. Uh, this is faster than any other generation we've seen before. Okay. So with that, uh, I'm going to change gears and talk about 5G IoT for a little bit. I think I have about 10 or 15 minutes before questions. So uh, what I wanted to point out is that people often talk about 5G as a technology that does everything, right? It's gonna do this high bandwidth and it's gonna do IoT applications for every bicycle and every skateboard. We, we have a different view of that, okay? Um, we, we think of these things as very different, not just from an end use point of view, but as radio engineers, the, the radios are very different for those two purposes and the economics are very different for those two businesses. Uh, so let's, let's talk about what I mean here. Um, and one of the things we talk about is, you know, whether I, IoT is gonna transition over 
to 5G and all these different kinds of devices. Um, and some of the problems I have with that concept is that narrowband IoT devices are pretty cheap. You know, they're, they're only going to cost about $3 for the entire device uh, by 2022. Uh, would a 5G device be any cheaper? Um, is there you know, any savings inherently in the semiconductors to make that cheaper than a, a narrowband IoT device? I don't see it. And so uh, the transition point is something I would really question. Uh, and especially from the point of view of the vertical markets, you know, when we look at uh, some of the markets, the, the, the colorful boxes here are, are indicating the amount of time that one of these IoT devices would be in the field. So for example, if they put a smart meter on my house and now they're tracking my water usage with one of these meters, they put in the smart meter and they expect it to last for 40 years. Okay, they're going to change the battery after 10 or 20 years. Okay, uh, when we look at the automotive case, uh, they have an automotive design cycle that lasts about seven years, and then they, they expect the car to live for 20 years after that. So that's 27 years that that IoT device has to follow a certain format, and so on and so forth. Streetlights are expected to last for 50 years, um, um, and so I think it's really funny that you know the. 3GPP standards groups and the mobile industry is really hyperactive when you look at it from this point of view. Uh, we're going to go through eight releases of the standard before they even change the battery on my smart meter. <laughs> okay. There's something wrong with this picture, right? Uh, and what you realize is that, well, hey, you know, these car companies, these utilities, uh, the street light guys, they don't want a standard that's changing. They want a standard that stays the same. And they don't see the benefit of the economic changes with standards. We, we just talked about that in the broadband case where the, the change from one standard to the next was, was able to drive more spectral efficiency, was able to bring down the dollars per gigabyte served. In the IoT market, they don't care, right? They're only using a kilobyte at a time. They don't care how much that costs. What they want is something that they can last for 40 years and just keep using it. So uh, I think the factors that will really impact the IoT growth is it's not new standards creating growth. It's, it's uh, you know, enterprises don't, first of all, they don't trust the mobile operators to support these legacy standards for a long time. We've already seen AT&T drop out of GSM and all the millions of customers they left hanging on that one. Uh, I think a lot of those enterprise customers remember and they, they don't want to go back to the mobile industry. Uh, also, if you're changing standards every 18 months, the devices never get to economy of scale. If you build 10 million devices and then move on to the next standard, then build 10 million more, that's not as good as building the same one for 10 years and just letting the natural economics uh, bring the cost down. Um, so I think the growth will actually come in terms of longer product life cycles, larger economy of scale, and comfort with the customers knowing that this is going to be around for a while. Uh, just to show some of the economics, we talked about dollars per gigabyte before. Uh, if we look in terms of mobile operators supporting revenue for every megabyte of IoT data, um, the AT&T button is a good example of this. They, they sell this button for $29.99, okay? You get three years of prepaid data, uh, which is roughly the equivalent of something like uh, 5,000 clicks of the button, something like that. And it works out to about $60 for every megabyte of data that AT&T serves. Uh, so uh, on the LTE network, you know, if it's a dollar or so to deliver each gigabyte, uh, they're getting $60 of revenue per megabyte. Uh, again, they don't care about the cost of the data. What they, what they want to do is maximize the number of devices, maximize the number of people. It's all about revenue and not about cost. Um, the, the really interesting cases are these cases for ultra-reliable, low-latency communications, okay? So these are things like a robot in a factory, uh, maybe an excavator machine, uh, something like that, a drone that's delivering packages. Uh, I talked to a, a guy who's, uh, who's got a, a pilot service like this in Japan where he's delivering packages by drone. And they have a, an island in uh, Yokohama Harbor. And they, uh, they deliver packages to all the people on this island by drone, and he's operating the system. And uh, uh, what he said was really interesting is that most of the time, the drone can go out there, find the address, drop the package on the doorstep, and leave, and everything's fine. But sometimes there might be a dog in the yard, or small children running around, or it's windy, or something's going on where it's unsafe. Uh, there has to be some human judgment involved. The, you don't trust the drone to go in there and, and land amid the kids while they're playing their games. 
uh, right? So you have a human that makes a decision about whether it's safe or whether they should come back later. And, uh, and so in taking over that drone, they need high bandwidth because it's an HD video stream going over a, a long distance, okay? It's mobile, it has to be handing off, okay? And you need low latency because this guy needs to push buttons to control the drone and it, it has to have a fast enough reaction time for that to work. That's a, an excellent case for 5G uh, low latency communications um, coming into the market. Uh, and so that's, I think, one of the biggest wild cards, one of the biggest growth opportunities for 5G in the IoT area is something like that, where someone's willing to pay a huge price for every megabyte. I mean, these guys would pay thousands of dollars for every megabyte of control data. Um, and, uh, and at the same time, it, it needs some of the things that 5G has to offer. So this is one of the things we're tracking in our forecast, is that if these drones really take off, we will get into millions of devices per year. Uh, but without that, honestly, I think when we look at the uh, 5G forecast, uh, it, it doesn't really measure up to the kinds of IoT devices we already have, things like narrowband IoT and Laura. Okay, so to sum it up, what is 5G really all about? For me, in the broadband case, it's really all about a cheaper video. It's about economics, not speed. Okay, and what people want is video. That video will change over time. It'll go from 4K to 8K to virtual reality or augmented reality. So it will change and the bandwidth will increase. Uh, this is all about delivering those things cheap enough that people can actually pay for it on their phone. The IoT market, I think the 5G IoT market is a niche. Uh, it might be a really useful niche for some cases, uh, but we're not talking about hundreds of millions or billions of devices here. Uh, so you have to think about it in those terms. It's a, it's a premium application. Um, and then magical new 5G applications. What are people going to dream of that we don't know about yet? There will be something. Uh, what I'm saying is that I think that'll take a while. We need to justify this 5G investment now. And I think looking at things like the entertainment business and some of these drone applications, those are the things I would focus on right now. Okay, thank you very much. I'm intrigued by your drone delivery. It stands for robotic delivery in San Francisco, right? And not the drone, just a three wheel car or something. So if the operator has to intervene and, and needs a video link that allows him to navigate a, a street in San Francisco, um, what are you going to see as a scenario where, or that's Shanghai or Korea, what's the cost to the operator for the fee? And what's the spec of the fee? What's latency and what's the map? I'm just trying to figure out that scenario. What's, what's the economics and what's the technology? Right. Yeah, this is, this is a good question. So I think there's, there's two things. One is, one is the radio link that's required to control that device. <coughs> Whether it's a cart or a flying drone, uh, you need uh, control signals to, to manage that device. And that bandwidth is actually quite low. Uh, so that might be in a, a lower frequency band, like the 600 megahertz band, where you're controlling the drone that way. Then there's a video stream that's a high bandwidth requirement, uh, and that's where the economics are more challenging. Uh, that's where, if you're on the LTE network, as we said before, that's a dollar for every gigabyte. It's, you know, if you, if you spend five minutes trying to land the drone, that, that could be uh, pretty expensive in terms of the LTE bandwidth. Um, so if you have the three or four gigahertz 5G option, then you just brought down your, your cost per gigabyte to a level where that might be affordable. Um, certainly the millimeter wave case would be more affordable, but I think the coverage problems in the millimeter wave band would make that hurt probably at uh, I think you're limited to a little snips of video, really. I think you had a question. Here. Yeah, so I had a question about one of the first slides where you had the cost per gigabyte and split up in the different elements that come to the cost. So you had a back home network. And I think it was showing like a dramatic decrease in the cost per gigabyte of the backhaul. So are you assuming a wired backhaul? I'm assuming fiber in all fiber. those cases. So yeah. in the very beginning, I guess the decrease would be what the backhaul is underutilized. So as you increase the wireless part, the speed, you are using more of the fiber you already put in place. So you don't right. really That's good. Fiber I like that. the, but once you are getting to higher frequencies where you need smaller cells and Personally, you would need to play more fiber or have higher density of uh, base stations. when your cost per gigabyte and backhaul are increasing? I think if you have to install another fiber, if you have to dig up the street again to transfer another fiber, then absolutely you're adding more cost. Uh, what, what we're assuming is that you know, these fibers are normally installed in bundles uh, where they'll, you know, they'll have excess capacity because the fiber itself is pretty cheap. 
Uh, it's the, the process of getting permits and closing down a street and then digging up the street and putting a new conduit in and then pulling the fiber through. That, that whole process is where the expense goes. So what we've seen, for example, recently with Verizon, is they deploy their LTE small cells. They're deploying oh, something like 20 times the capacity they need for that small cell um, and uh, taking advantage of the conduit they have and trying to future-proof that. So they're planning far enough out that they could, they could actually implement that millimeter wave capacity on the fiber they have. So the economics are really about you spend the money once, and then the more bandwidth you can shove through that fiber, the, the smaller that element becomes in terms of dollars per day. I'm going to ask you a question. Yeah. Uh, in the news, we're starting to hear about installations of 5G, very early installations. And I wonder if you could give us an update on that and also the role of Samsung networks in terms of participating in that. Yeah, that's a good one. It's very timely because actually Verizon Wireless has uh, four cities that they've turned on their 5G service uh, just this week. Um, so October 1st, yesterday, was, was the first day that they went live with this commercial service. And, uh, and Samsung Networks have been a big part of that because Samsung was the, the, the earliest and best company through the field trial process with Verizon, and they really pioneered this. Um, so in places like Sacramento and Houston, uh, Samsung has done an excellent job with, with laying out these, these small cells with, with achieving the sort of economics that I'm talking about. What's next? Uh, and what's next? Uh, well, I mean, the way Verizon has started this process uh, they've got Ericsson and Samsung supporting their own sort of proprietary format, which is called 5G TF, the 5G Task Force, uh, which is a variety, a variety of special. Uh, but the transition plan is for those base stations to be converted over to the standard 3GPP version, which is called 5G NR. And, uh, and once that happens, it'll become mobile capable. So not just a, a fixed service to to a CPE on the house, but it could be a mobile service to some kind of a hotspot that you move around. You've been talking about speed. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about latency, because when you have online collaboration gamers, like to play games in different locations and <coughs> different geography areas, do so the reaction time to a particular scene and then that getting transmitted to others, wouldn't speed actually be a difference there? And can it be can it can it be served with the existing speeds of what we actually have in case of 5G that's not? Yeah, actually, you know, the, the bigger issue here is not so much the, the radio speed, but the latency of the computing platforms themselves. Um, in, in LTE, we have latencies in the tens of milliseconds. It could be 10 or 20 milliseconds. And with 5G, we can be down to one millisecond. Okay, so that is a savings. Uh, but uh, the, the greater amount of time is spent for, you know, if I'm, if I'm playing games with a guy who lives next door, okay, uh, and there's a compute platform in the cloud somewhere, uh, both of us have to send our, our uh, content up to the cloud platform, uh, wherever that data center is, and then it comes back again. Uh, if that's hundreds of miles, now you're adding hundreds of milliseconds of, of latency to the process. Um, so the most important factor in getting those low latency applications is something called edge computing. Of course, we are, you're now moving the compute platform closer to the users. Um, you can also improve the radio latency by moving on to 5G, but uh, I think to achieve the kinds of uh, uh, gaming uh, experiences that you're talking about, we need to do both of those things. So when you, when you say edge computing, you mean things like how Netflix is deploying last night caches of their content to improve the latency? Yeah, that's right. Uh, actually, I have had another question. Uh, so, if essentially 5G is about faster cat videos on YouTube, why is the government talking about national security aspects of 5G? I didn't get that. <laughs> well, this is it, it, there's a lot of different aspects to this. Um, one thing, let me point out one one thing that I've noticed over the last 15 years. Um, during 2G and 3G days. The Chinese vendors were, were actually quite weak in terms of being able to sell mobile networks and phones uh, on a worldwide basis. Uh, they were really behind the Western markets. Uh, but during the 4G process, during 2011 through about 2015, the Chinese government made this decision that they would use Chinese vendors for 80% for of their network, uh, and they would 
build up a huge 4G network with much more capacity than they needed. They, they ended up with about 2 million base stations in China for 4G compared to 200,000 base stations in the U.S. market for a similar size country, uh, geographic size. Uh, and, and so what they did is they, they invested a, a huge amount of money into 4G with excess capacity and forced it to be built by Chinese vendors. And that put Huawei and ZTE up to the top tier of the mobile market. Okay? It also brought up companies like Xiaomi and many other Chinese handset brands to be able to, to support that. Okay? Now they're exporting that technology, and now it's a, it's a bit of a battle or a trade war, and we've seen that happen. You see it on TV every night. Uh, in the 5G cycle, what I'm seeing now is that there's going to be another big investment by the Chinese government. Again, they're going to use Huawei, CTE, and other Chinese OEMs to provide the network. But now they're driving down to the next level where they want to use Chinese chip companies. Uh, they want to have memory, compute, RF done by Chinese companies, which has been historically pretty weak. Uh, but they're, they're going to have to make another five-year cycle of investment to try to build up those companies to try to replace us there. And, and then they have all the capabilities that we have. Uh, so right now, in terms of national defense, and getting back to your question of, is this really a national security thing? I think a country having those technologies and having the semiconductor technology to support all of it, it does have implications on the national security side as well. There's a question in the back there. Hi. Uh, you talked about uh, IoT being a niche for 5G. Uh, a quick So um, my question is related to automotive, though. Uh, a low latency requirement on a network is, uh, seems critical from what we read around uh, to automotive and 5G is being touted to do that for, five, for automotive. Uh, can you comment on that? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. And, and uh, you hear this all the time that you know, for connected cars, uh, for self-driving cars, we have to have 5G. So, uh, so actually, my company went and we decided we're going to talk to the car companies and ask what they think. We talked to General Motors and Ford, Honda, Toyota, Volkswagen, a few others. And uh, all of them said the same thing. 10 to 20 milliseconds is fine. And that surprised us because faster is better when it's life and death, right? Uh, but their point of view is that they've tested uh, a technology called 802.11p, uh, DSRC technology. They've tested that thoroughly over the last 12 years. And that has a, a latency of in the range of 15 milliseconds. And uh, what they found is that the, the time involved with these mechanical systems, braking systems, and so on, uh, it's, it's long enough that, that 15 milliseconds doesn't really matter very much. Uh, and uh, that, that's one aspect of it. The other aspect is that the, these self-driving cars make all of their decisions on board. So they don't rely on any radios to, to send them any information to make a decision about stopping the car. That's entirely an onboard decision. Uh, they, they intend to use the vehicle to infrastructure communications, the telematics, to do things like updated maps. Um, there would be useful information. Uh, one good example that Volvo is working on is that if a car is driving on a road and it slips on the ice, uh, then the car will make a note that in these location, on, on the second lane of this highway, there's ice uh, and you might slip. That gets sent to the network, and then every car that comes down that road is going to get a, an alert that on this curve, be careful, slow down, there's ice. Uh, that's not a millisecond thing. Uh, that, that's sent to the cars two or three seconds at least before they get to that, that bend in the road. Um, so I think they're looking at it as, as uh, it would be useful, it would be nice, but they're not going to pay any extra for uh, dropping latency below 15 milliseconds. Uh, one more back there. Um, many of the places now have the uh, hotspots, and Wi-Fi is also tapping into the millimeter wave uh, spectrum. So how 5G is going to compete in the future uh, cost as is with Wi-Fi? Okay, yeah, this is similar to the wired question. Uh, Wi-Fi is always cheaper. It has always been cheaper than mobile. Um, and part of that is the spectrum cost simply isn't there. Okay. Uh, it, it, the other thing is that they're, they're generally in locations where they're not paying for access to polls and these kind of things. Uh, again, I think 
we're going to continue to see this curve where 8 to 11 AX is now uh, wide bandwidth in the previous round, and so the economics for Wi-Fi has gotten that much better. Um, and uh, they will continue to do things like that. So Wi-Fi will continue to be cheaper than 4G or 5G in terms of dollars per gigabyte. The question you have to ask is, when is it cheap enough that you don't check anymore, uh, that you don't care about the difference between Wi-Fi and LTE, Wi-Fi and 5G? My kids have already gotten there because they don't pay the bill. Uh, <laughs> they just use LTE. But, uh, it, but it's true that in, in places where uh, you have these unlimited plans, uh, in, in uh, India, for example, Reliance Geo has now come out with these plans where you can get uh, 100 gigabytes uh, for a very low cost. Of, uh, I want to say it's something like $40 for a 100 gigabyte bucket. Um, and so uh, that's, that's cheaper than what we have in the uh, US unlimited plans which are throttled back after about 20 gigabytes. So I, I think we're going to see more and more of that where the mobile systems get to a point where the unlimited buckets are really quite big and uh, nobody will care about the difference in cost. Next question. Uh, are you seeing any bundler? bundler? Because uh, my phone and I think uh, YouTube is always slow. I mean, even though the phone support 5G, how can you solve to all the bundlers? And which device will be uh, sold more in the next five years because of the device? Yeah, I think what you're talking about is when you click on a video, it takes a while to, to begin to load, you know, buffering, you know, these kind of things. And you wonder why is it taking so long, right? It should be able to start pretty much immediately. Uh, but we're talking about the latency for the server. Um, this, is, this is not connection time. This is more latency in, in getting a server to load that video and, and to get it in the pipeline and to start buffering into your phone. Your phone has to reach a certain level where it has enough memory to begin. So, you know, I think caching these things will make a big difference. Uh, to, to put more of those caches in place, whether it's in a local data center or some uh, nationwide data center, uh, I think that's really the investment that's needed to improve the experience. Um, so one of the things that the telecom industry has always struggled with is the fragmentation of the standards. Right? Like in the 2G days, you have CDMA, TDMA, GSM. 3G days, you have CDMA, 2000, right? WCDMA, etc. Right? And then LTE was supposed to be the unifying force right? after it destroyed uh, WiMAX. Right? So now, uh, do you see 5G being unifying across the entire world? Or do you expect fragmentation to happen at some point? because this, uh, this uh, Made in China initiative. Yeah, okay, this is, a, this is a good question also. I was involved when the GSM standards were first developed. Um, what was interesting about that, the, the original GPRS implementations, it was one standard. Every amplifier ran at 30 watts. It ran on the same frequency band. Uh, everything was the same. There, there, there were no menus of different options. It was just, here's how the network works. But over 2G to 3G to 4G, now 5G, the standards have become more and more uh, optional. That you, can, you can implement all these different type module uh, uh, modes and, and uh, modulation schemes. Uh, you can implement many different bands. Uh, you can choose what power level class you'd like to be in. Uh, so uh, no two networks are alike anymore, um, even in LTE. Uh, you can go to uh, two networks in the same country serving the same population, and some of the configurations are completely different. So, you know, I think what we've done is we've reached a place in the, in the industry where the hardware is common, but we have a lot of these software features where you can now define you know, how you want that coding scheme to work, uh, which frequency band it's going to be in, and you try to make the hardware as agnostic as you can. Uh, I, I think that's really going to be the trend for a long time to come, is that people want software-defined networks. Yeah, so my question is, how did you uh, come up with the numbers regarding spectral efficiency for 5G below 10 gig and above? So for below 10 gig, it's probably comparable to 4G plus some additions. Already 4G is highly optimized. So 5G is just trying to squeeze a little bit more, and based on what I've heard, maybe can give you 50% extra spectral efficiency, but it's not going to be like order of magnitude as it had been before, right? And above 10 gig, talking about massive MIMO arrays of like 256 antennas and so on, right? Right. It's great on paper, 
my channel capacity increases linear with a number of antennas, but there are practical things that you need to consider, like channel estimation, uh, how long channel stays the same after you learn it, right? right? So you probably have to make some assumptions and you have to run simulations. I don't know if it's yet known how much all these proposed improvements will actually be translated into actual needs. Right. What we do is we, we take results from field trials and we'll plug those into our models. So, for example, the spectral efficiency, you're absolutely right. The 5G waveform itself, given the same channel bandwidth, it's only about 10 or 20 percent better than LTE. 50 uh, percent, I think, will never be achieved. Uh, so that's not even worthwhile to make a change uh, for 10 percent improvement. Uh, the, the main difference in economics for 5G is that now we're talking about wider bands. Instead of a 20 megahertz channel, now we can do a 100 megahertz channel. And so that's five times the bandwidth for the same fixed cost of having an amplifier and a fiber and a concrete pad and a tower. Now you're delivering five times more stuff. Uh, so I think that's really the important factor in the economics is just spectrum. Uh, so the 5G and our way for more spectrum, it's, it was already available. You could have made five parallel channels in front of 20. You could have the same base station. Does it save an equipment by doing one wider versus? You could do five parallel channels on the same radio, and that's really the same thing. Uh, this is one reason why it has a 10% improvement, is that you're, you're getting rid of some of the overhead by doing one fat channel instead of five skinny channels. Uh, so that's. So then sub 10, why does it make sense? It, it doesn't really. Yeah. Uh, the, the things that make sense are massive MIMO is useful. Uh, you can do that on LTE, or you can do it on 5G. So that's a minor is a, a nice improvement, and having wider frequency bands available is a good improvement. Do we know yet where massive MIMO actually work as expected? Yeah, it's, it's there are about 20,000 massive MIMO uh, base stations in the field today. Uh, in Tokyo and uh, Beijing, I believe, uh, Shanghai, uh, we have SoftBank and China Mobile have deployed tens of thousands of these, and they work. Uh, there's definitely a spectral efficiency improvement there. I've seen a lot of field trials in the U.S. market where it, it works quite well. Uh, so, uh, you can think of massive MIMO as just a, an extreme level of sectorization for the cell. Uh, instead of having three sectors in a 360 degree cell, now you can break it into hundreds of sectors with little narrow beams. Uh, so, that's how I look at it. Um, question from WebEx. What is the integration between 5G networks and emergency networks, in particular ESI and ESI nets? which are used in public safety, such as Next Generation 911? Okay, yeah, this is a good question, and, and we might want to get into the details offline. Uh, there, each country has different requirements for public safety, and, and, uh, and some of them are really interesting. In the U.S. market, we have a, a public safety ban which is set aside, and uh, you know, in emergency situations, you really need that, it has to take priority. Um, in non-emergency situations, it's sort of slack bandwidth that no one's using. So AT&T made this proposal that they would use the, uh, the LTE spectrum, uh, that first net spectrum, uh, for commercial purposes. But whenever there's a priority case that comes up, they'll actually devote that spectrum as well as their commercial spectrum to the, uh, the emergency responders. Um, so I think that's one of the best implementations that I've seen. Um, other cases are, you know, where public safety uh, would be mandated on commercial networks by just using the commercial bands. Uh, but it sort of goes on country by country basis. All right, I do have one more question because I haven't heard it mentioned yet. So uh, one of the advantages of 5G has been network slicing. I haven't heard you say anything about that. And it seems like that would be good for the operators. It's quite good, yeah. I, uh, we haven't really been able to do an ROI study on network slicing yet because it's hard to know how much that's going to cost. Uh, what is the difference in implementation cost at the network level? We haven't seen that yet. Uh, but the benefit, I think, is, is interesting because the, the problem that the operators have right now is that if, they, if they're approached by an enterprise, let's say they're approached by a large electric utility that wants to monitor all the transformers on their grid. Uh, they want to do something simple like monitor the temperature of every transformer. What the, the utility will ask for is a guarantee of 99.999% availability of the network. The network has to be there five nines all the time. And uh, the mobile companies will step back and say, well, we can't guarantee that because we have all this other traffic going on. We don't have a, a mechanism to set aside resources just for you. 
so they, they end up not making a deal happen. And, uh, and so we've seen a lot of those opportunities come and go, and, and nothing really happens. Um, I think with network slicing now, the operator could actually guarantee that certain resources will be set aside no matter what. And um, you know, similar to the, the public safety case where you might have priority users, this would be a super priority user that always has a dedicated channel. And, uh, and you pay for that. Uh, but, but I think there are enterprises that are willing to do that. So, so there is a revenue benefit lying out there waiting for people to come up with network slicing and make it work. Well, uh, that's all the time we have for questions right now. Our speaker will be up here if you want to talk to him.